Let's, um, let's pray, and then I want to read a passage of Scripture, and then what I intend to do is uh, bring, um, talk about the Presbyterian meeting that we had on Friday, just so you guys can enter into that work and the work of the church beyond our own. And so I'm just going to walk through our docket and what we, what we did at Presbyterian and explain a th- few things about Presbyterian polity along the way. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your Lord's Day. It is good to be uh, exhorted, commanded to rest and to um, keep this day and honor it. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in that and that our hearts and our minds and our souls would be refreshed in the worship of you and in your word and um, in our fellowship at our home groups. Lord, I pray that you would um, bless us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So, um, I'm pretty convinced that Presbyterian polity is the um, best expression of biblical government in the church. That doesn't mean that I don't see other forms um, being biblical, maybe not as hive an expression of the biblical um, governance. Uh, Congregationalism has, uh, congregationalism becomes Presbyterian whenever they have problems, right? And so when congregationalist churches have a problem, they usually put together a coalition of churches to deal with the pastor who's going crazy or something like that. And so they sort of func- they they become Presbyterian in their um, in their rule when they when they really need government. So um, you know, so I can fit that in pretty well, and uh, especially if that congregational body has three offices of pastor, elder, and deacon, then they're they're pretty much. Um, similar to what we have. Now, um, let me read where we get some basis for Presbyterian polity, and that's in Exodus 18, where you remember Moses is judging all the disputes of the people. And who tells him to stop it? His father-in-law Jethro, right? Came about The next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood about Moses from the morning until the evening. Now when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge and all the people stand about you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, stop it. No, he said, the thing that you are doing is not good. You will surely wear out both yourself and these people who are with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me, I will give you counsel and God be with you. You be the people's representative before God, and you bring the disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place them over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Let them judge the people at all times, and let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you. But every minor dispute they themselves will judge, so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure. And all these people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, leaders over thousands of hundreds of fifties and of tens. They judged the people at all times, the difficult dispute they would bring to Moses, but every minor dispute they themselves would judge. Then Moses bade his father-in-law farewell, and he went away into his own land. Wonderful 
wonderful counsel from a father-in-law, right? He sees his son-in-law being overburdened by the work and the people becoming dispirited because he just can't maintain doing all this work, right? By four in the afternoon, he's probably angry and hungry and just shouting out his judgments at these people, telling them to stop disputing, you know? And so it can be done in a better way. And so this just gives us this principle of of, um, courts of appeals, higher courts and lower courts, right? But choosing able men who share the work, right? So Presbyterian, you know, everybody thinks Presbyterian means you're Pado baptist No, not primarily. It means you're ruled by a plurality of elders, right? So the work of the session, the session is what we call our elder boards because it's a it's a combination of elders and pastors, right? And so there's shared work there, um, and we share the work. And then there's a presbytery over us that examines our work and makes sure we're being faithful to do the work, right? And they review our work, and then they may have suggestions for us for how to do the work better. That all was taking place after Moses set this system up in Israel. And, um, and so we take some of our cues from that. But the general, the general structure of, of Presbyterian churches is you have, you have three, we are a three office denomination, not two office like many Presbyterian denominations, we're three office. So we make a, a stronger distinction between ministers of the word and elders, right? Ministers of the word, their primary job is to administer the sacraments and preach the word of God. Elders rule the congregation. They govern the congregation um, spiritually and um, do a lot of the work that we normally think of that pastors would do, this, this shepherding and spiritual care. And those two two offices sit together in the session. That's our elder board, okay? And so um, the, mo- the moderator of the elder board is the senior pastor, and he has that by virtue of his office. He moderates the meetings. He leads the meetings. There has to be a leader to operate good meetings, but the leader is considered one among equals, right? The elders and the The pastors all have one vote, and often the moderator of the meetings will not vote if the session is is large enough. Um, I vote during our session meetings because we only have two elders. Um, And then uh, there are deacons. The other office is the diaconate, and the deacons meet as a board generally once a month, and their job is to love the friendless, and to take care of those who are destitute, who are having trouble. And, um, and so that spiritual work frees up the elders and pastors to do the work of um, shepherding and spiritual examination. And, um, and so we have that. But then every... Uh, Four months, we have a presbytery meeting, and all the pastors are members of presbytery. Something you also need to know about Presbyterian polity is I am not a member of Trinity Presbyterian Church. I'm a member of Evangel Presbytery, right? And so my wife, my children, they're members here, but I hold my membership at the presbytery. They installed me here. They have authority over me. They do the discipline of me. If it, you know, they function as the session to me would in in your case. And then, so all the pastors are members of Presbytery, and so go and vote. But then commissioners from each church are sent from among the, the elders. And you can send a certain number of commissioners depending on how many elders or the size of your church. The, more, the, the larger your church, the more commissioners you send. And so 
That happened on Friday. All these commissioners and elders, and we have guests, and we had some corresponding brethren from other denominations, all came together uh, to, to do the work of the church, a very vital part of the work of the church. Um, this is not the work of the church that you guys get to see, but it's something that pastors and elders are constantly engaged in. And so I just wanted to open up this black box so that you knew what we do in presbytery meetings. Um, there, Presbyterians love committees, okay? We, we, are, <laughs> we put together committees to figure out what other committees are supposed to do. Uh, that happens quite a lot. Um, but uh, these committees have certain orders, and they have to fulfill those roles. And so the permanent committees that we have are, are these. The administration, uh, Administrative and Nominations Committee. I'm the chairman of that committee. That committee determines the docket for the upcoming presbytery meetings. So we make sure all the, the ducks are in a row for the presbytery meeting. That's what the administrative committee does. We, do, we come up with the budget. We deal with all of that and present it to the presbytery. Nominations committee, we nominate men for the permanent committees and like a new moderator or something like that. We would be the committee to nominate. Then there's the candidates and credentials committee. And those are the guys who examine men who are coming into uh, a call, who are taking up a call. So Matt Shiflett just went through the grueling process of becoming licensed, and he did pass, and he did excellently. One of the best, one of the best licensure exams I've ever seen in 20-some years. So he did really, really well. Um, but don't tell him. We don't. <laughs> he, did, he did so well. I, I heard he told him. Um, but that candidates and credentials, candidates are students who are training to become pastors, and credentials is all the men who have credentials. And so the, this committee deals with that. Who are our candidates? How is their education going? And... Uh, and all of our credentials, you know, should this person be ordained or not, you know. And so they examine, that committee examines everybody who wants to come into the presbytery. And like with, with Matt, um, for licensure you have, it's like a three or four step process. So he had to write a sermon and submit a manuscript he had uh, an examination on the book of church order. He had examination on the Bible you know, and an examination on theology. You know, the theology exam is 90-some questions. That, and, you know, the BCO exam is a little shorter. It's 35, 40 questions. And Bible is very, very extensive. And so he write, he. He uh, took all the written exams, right, and he submits those to the committee. The committee reviews and grades the exams, and then Matt comes and sits with the committee for about a two-hour long meeting where we go through the exams and say, and, and point out all the flaws and say, is that what you really meant? And hadn't you thought of this? And, and no, that's wrong. And, and I, I don't think he... He'd be ashamed of me saying, saying this, but we failed him on his BCO exam um, in committee and said, you have another week to come back and get these things right, but, but you, you need to do that. And he came back another week, and it was virtually flawless. He did very well with that. But um, his first take was not, was not so great. Um, so then... That's not the end of it. The committee then just makes recommendations to the presbytery, and then Matt had, what Matt did on Friday is preach before the, the assembly. So he preached that sermon that he had written, and then he has floor exams on each of those areas. So right in front of everybody, he's asked about the doctrine of atonement. He's asked about 
you know, the, the ins and outs of the Book of Church Order. He's asked about, um, you know, give an outline of the Book of Galatians. And he blanked on Galatians 3, but we'll forgive him for that. Every time you're up for an examination, you either say something quasi-heretical or you forget something obvious, right? It's, it always ha- it happens to every man, you know? Um, God is two persons in one nature. You know, that's the sort of thing that comes out of your mouth and you're like, mm, or Jesus is two persons in one nature. Yikes. Um, that's heresy. <clears throat> so, but then after each of the exams, so the, the chairman, Stephen Baker, of the Candidates and Credentials Committee asks some questions from the exam, but then the floor is open for anybody to ask them anything they want in those areas. So it's, it's much like a doctoral orals, if, if, you know, um, if you've heard somebody getting their doctorate and they go in and have to make a defense they, they have to show their knowledge, right? Their thorough knowledge. Because we're about to say, when you get licensed, we're about to say, we've examined you in theology, and now you can regularly preach in evangelical Presbytery churches. The door is open to you. You can preach as much as you want now in evangelical Presbytery churches. And so um, he did very well on the floor, very well on the floor. So excited. So that's the Candidates and Credentials Committee. There's the Shepherding Committee. The Shepherding Committee is the committee, if there are any troubles in any of our churches, the Shepherding Committee gets, uh, jumps into it, tries to help out, you know. Um, if there's a dispute in the church, if the church is breaking into factions, if there's animosity between the elders and the pastor, the Shepherding church, uh, Committee would come in and help with that. There's the Committee on Church Planting and Domestic Missions, right? So any new church plants, this committee is going to shepherd those through. We have three church plants, Chinese Reformed Church in Bloomington, Christ Church in Columbus, Indiana, and Church of the King in Evansville, Indiana. And so those churches are not what's called particularized, meaning they don't have their own elders, the presbytery supplies the elders for those churches. I sit on, you guys probably don't even know this, but I sit on the Chinese Reformed Church of Bloomington's session, temporary session. And so I'm, I'm helping with the work um, that Jason Chen is doing there. All right, so that's the church planning committee. And then there's the, the, um, the committee that no one wants to be on. It's the committee that Chuck Fultz is on. Uh, Renton Renton is on the church planning committee, by the way. Um, Chuck Fultz is on the the sessional records committee. And what is the, it's a very important, it's, it may be one of the most, maybe the most important committee. But the sessional records committee reviews the minutes of every church's session meetings. So they're going through and reading and making sure that not only are the minutes in order, but have you done anything out of order? Like, they'll see, here's the process you followed with with formal discipline, and they'll flag things that you're like, you know, you guys skipped this step that the BCO requires, right? You, You didn't write an indictment. You just brought somebody in and made them plea, and they had never received an indictment 10 days before that you know, so they look through all of that, and it's good, it's good to have that accountability. In other words, they're holding, up, they're holding up the BCO, and they're saying, this is how we do things. Why are you not doing things like this? You're out of order. You need to get in order, or we're going we're gonna to adjudicate your case before the entire presbytery. Um, But all these permanent committees make reports at every presbytery, and they come with recommendations. These committees can't make any decisions themselves. All they can do is make recommendations, and then the whole presbytery makes the decisions on those recommendations, okay? So I just wanted to go, those are our permanent committees. Those committees make a report at every presbytery meeting. But let me go back to the beginning of our docket. 
So when we have a meeting, it's usually a Thursday or a Friday, and the meeting starts at 9. Usually we have some nice provided breakfast at 8.30 by the church, the host church. And um, 9 o'clock we start, we immediately have a worship service right at the beginning. of. of we take about an hour, hour and a half, and we worship the Lord. Um, we invite one of the presbyters to preach. Usually the host church pastor will superintend the Lord's table and will serve the Lord's Supper. And so we begin with worship and prayer. And then we introduce anybody who's visiting, like if any of you came to the meeting, you would be introduced at this portion of the meeting. And if you came from, we had a pastor from a, a Reformed Baptist Church, we had another ordained man who was there. We actually seated them as corresponding members, which gives them voice but no vote in the meetings. And so we just want to be, uh, have a Catholic spirit um, in that. And you know how I mean Catholic. Um, then we, um, I know this is exciting, just keep, keep with me. All you Presbyterians out there are like, yeah, this sounds great. Um, then we adopt the docket, and then we appoint a parliamentarian. And a parliamentarian just makes sure we're doing everything according to Robert's rules of order. And it's good to have rules of order in a meeting, or else somebody will dominate the meeting. The whole reason you have rules in a meeting is so that you can shut up those people who want to dominate every conversation. And there's always a few of those in every presbytery meeting, right? Right? But Robert's rules allows the moderator to, to determine how the meeting is going to go and puts rules in place for how you make motions, how you debate motions. Everything's laid out. And it's, it takes years to learn how to function according to Robert's rules. Um, so we appoint that parliamentarian who can say, uh uh uh. We did. That's a committee motion. That does not need a second. Things like that. Um, and then we adopt the minutes from the previous meeting. Those are reviewed. We review. Um, then our moderator this, this time took a sort of a point of personal privilege and talked to us about executive session rules. An executive session is when you're dealing with a matter that you think is sensitive and you send anybody who's not a commissioner out of the room. They can't stay any longer. And so what happens in executive session is meant to be secret. And it has even a separate set of notes from the main notes for the meeting. It's meant to be secret. And um, there are times when discipline is happening that that's an appropriate thing to go into. Um, sessions can operate the same way. We can go into executive session and boot non-commissioners out of the room. So we talked through that just because we think in the previous meeting we should have gone into an executive session on a sensitive issue and we did not. And it was a failure. So we reviewed it this week. And then the stated clerk. stated clerk of a presbytery is the guy who keeps everything running between the meetings. Right? The stated clerk is just organizing everything. He's the guy keeping the presbytery running. And so he'll give a report. He'll talk about the roll call and letters of excuses. He informs the presbytery of any correspondence he's received. And, uh, and then he'll give a treasurer's report as well. Then, this, this time, we had a report of a temporary committee that was put together to investigate one single thing. Sessions or individuals in the presbytery can write what are called overtures to the presbytery, asking the presbytery to do something. Our session set up a pre, uh, an overture to the presbytery four, three or four months ago, asking that certain sections of the book of church order be removed and put into a doctrinal positions section 
rather than where they fell. It fell in like the form of government and the like our recent edition, we put a whole chapter in there on abortion. But it doesn't, it's a doctrinal position. It's not like how we run the churches. It's not the form of government. And so we asked them to figure out, how do we do this? And they came back with a report. It was excellent. It was really well done. But now the work of actually doing it has to happen. So the committee came back with good recommendations, and there will be a new section of the BCO, and we'll have to figure out what goes in it and what doesn't. And um, why is that important? You might say, well, that's just stupid Presbyterian anal retentiveness. Um, when a man comes in, what, what you should care about is that the men who come in are orthodox and that we have gatekeepers We've, we have men who are gatekeepers on candidates and credentials. We also have confessions and books of church order that are gatekeepers, right? And so what we do with those is very important. You, you have the Bible, right, which we don't amend. It is, it's the Word of God. It has all authority. But then you have the constitution of the church underneath the Scriptures, and the constitution of the church is the Westminster Confession of Faith, it's the Book of Church Order, and it's the other creeds, the, the Chalcedonian Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the Nicene, and the Apostles' Creed. Those are all confession or, uh, constitutional documents. But get this, you can, you can take an exception, right? The men coming in can say, here's a part of the Westminster Confession I don't agree with. And the presbytery can say, well, then you're out, or well, we allow that exception, right? In the book of church order, you can't take exceptions. The reason you can't take exceptions, that seems strange, like the higher order Westminster Confession you can take exceptions to, but, but the, the book of church order you can't. Well, the book of church order is, this is how we operate the church. You can't take exceptions to that. It's not biblical doctrine, it's just, it's not theology, it's just something, this is the way we do it, right? It's like if you went into a, a, a manufacturing plant and they had, here's how you turn this machine on, you flick this lever and you pull this down, you can't take exceptions to that. It has to work this way, right? And so the BCO, you can't, but here we just, we have, a, we have in our in our um, BCO, we have a full chapter on sexuality, which talks about things like, what do you do if somebody transgender comes into your church? What do you do with the bathrooms? Well, it's, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, and what do you do um, in the whole doctrine of sexuality? And then we just put in something on abortion last year. Very thorough statement on abortion. But those two things are very doctrinal. And so we need to pull them out of the BCO, put them into a doctrinal section so that men can request exceptions if they have disagreements on uh, any of those and see if the presbytery would allow such things. So we want to sort of make it closer to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So that's something we worked through in this meeting. Um, this is all for your good. This is pastors and elders doing things that take a lot of time and a lot of work, all for your good. That's what you have to remember. This seems abstract and distant, but this is all, this is all a part of protecting the sheep, and we want, we want to do well here. We could just be congregational, and I could just make up all the rules myself, right? I mean, I could be a little pope over Trinity Presbyterian Church. And I could just force my will on every committee, which is what happens in many Southern Baptist congregational style churches, right? The pastor is the Pope. But you get the picture that I'm just a little cog in, a, in, in, a, in this big machine. That's good. That's very good for us, right? I can't, I can't do anything 
without working with my session, without working with my presbytery, right? And that's good. It, it, brings, it, it brings us all into this um, process. All right, so that, we had a big report on that. It went very well. And then we had all the permanent committee's reports, and that's where Mikhail and Matt did their thing. Mikhail gave his testimony before the presbytery, talked about his call into the ministry, and he was received as what's called a candidate. That is somebody studying to become a pastor. And so he was received as a candidate. The presbytery will now oversee his education. And then, uh, and then Matt Shiflett did his licensure exam, did great. Um, very, very proud of him. Uh, Mikhail was very, Mer Mikhail thought he was nervous, but he wasn't. I mean, he, w he spoke so well and did, you know, didn't fumble his words. It was great. He did, he did very well. So, let's see, what else? Um, we, so we go through all those committee reports, and then we um, elected a new moderator because our moderators serve for one year, that's three meetings, but for the previous year or couple meetings, they're called what's, they're, they're called moderators in nomination so that they can start learning the work of moderating these meetings, which is not simple. You really have to know Robert's rules of order. And then we decided the time of the next meeting. So this summer we'll meet in Bloomington at Trinity Reformed. In the fall we'll meet at Clearnote in Indianapolis. And then in February of 2025 we'll meet in, uh, uh, near Indianapolis on the west side. And um, I suggested that they come down here for uh, Presbytery on, on in February of next year and they, they passed. Um, they said there are two churches way, well, there, Jeremy Vandergalian is a pastor who holds his credentials and works out of bounds, but his church is in North Wisconsin, and then ours is South Carolina, and then all the other churches are in the Midwest and, you know, well, about that much space, and so um, they determined that uh, we're only going to do at most one meeting at those outlying churches a year. And so Jeremy's going to host the summer of 2025. So I would imagine we'll host summer of 2026 um, here for the Presbytery meeting. Um, we closed the meeting off uh, with prayer and uh, we, we designate somebody to write a letter of thanks to the hosting church. And so that's, that's a presbytery meeting. That went from 9 until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was not, not a killer. Uh, we've had longer. Questions? Um, they do with the initial elders and deacons. If it's a church plant that's particularizing, the men who are becoming elders are examined by the presbytery. But after that, all the, the session would then examine other session members and deacons. They would do it in-house. But that initial group, yeah, it's the, it's, they're examined by the presbytery. Yep. Any other? Yeah, Greg. Greg. Um, well, the PCUSA has been apostate for 40, 50 years, so um, they just gave up on the inerrancy of the Word of God. And so they, they just started making up doctrine wholesale out of places other than the Scripture. The PCA, the PCA has made, has uh, failed to exercise church discipline. In other words, and especially at the presbytery level, pastors and elders disciplining pastors who are either heretical or immoral or teaching doctrines that are um, heretical and immoral. 
okay? And so like Missouri Presbytery never, ever, ever disciplined Greg Johnson, who was the man who really started, was in on the start of Revoice and um, the gay celibate Christian movement. They never disciplined him. He left the denomination last year, but he was never disciplined. I think he just got tired of the of the um, scrutiny. So I think that that was one of the reasons that we left the PCA is that um, they're just... Uh, you don't want to make discipline so hard that you can't ever exercise it. And the BCO can tend toward that, right? Um, it lays out a pretty scrupulous process, but, but you have to be committed to it. You have to be faithful to it. But there's so many um, backroom deals and handshakes and, you know, the the celebrities of the PCA making decisions for the whole denomination, which is not a Presbyterian concept. But I could go on and on. When the National Presbytery formed, was there one church that initially uh, pulled out and others joined later, or was it simultaneous with all uh, settlement? The, the original idea of it came from... Trinity Reformed Church in Bloomington and really is the mother church. But they had planted a number of church churches. And those churches didn't want to be independent Reformed churches. That's how they were created and existed. And so they looked into this, they looked into that, they looked into can we become associate members of, of the PCA? They looked into the CREC and that quickly fell apart. Um, the issue was that those churches were hybrid credo pedo baptist And so the Baptists didn't want us, the, the Presbyterian didn't want us, and they, they are very happy in dividing over that non-essential issue. Okay? And, and they would just not abide the thought of us having that hybrid model of credo and pedo together. Um... And I really, I really think Evangel Presbytery needs to lean into that distinction and say, look, look, look at us do it. Yeah, we're going to have road bumps and things are going to be difficult at points, but look at us do it. You know, you guys who get your undies in a bundle over timing and mode of baptism, who won't fellowship over the table with dear brothers who wouldn't, you know, the PCA not, not ever ordaining Charles Spurgeon or Charles Spurgeon's church not ever ordaining, pick your favorite Presbyterian, you know, John Murray. It's, it's insane, you know? And, and I'm not, that's not to, to completely water down the doctrine of baptism. It's funny. Every meeting we go to, we argue with one another about it, but collegially, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so that, so finding no place to fall, the next thing was, okay, we need to, we need to organize as a presbytery or a denomination, whatever you want to call it. I, I, for some reason, we don't use that word much. We just talk about our presbytery uh, and sort of lead with that. Um, yeah. Um, th- there is there is no reciprocity between Presbyterian and Reformed denominations. No. No, that he would. He, I mean, there is. I'm overstating it, but as far as licensure is concerned, regularly preaching in the pulpit, I think you would have to be licensed in each denomination. Now, if Matt gets ordained, they they would recognize his ordination, and he wouldn't. But coming in, they would still examine him. Like if he went into the OPC, they would still do what are called transfer exams. He wouldn't go through ordination exams, 
you know, he's already ordained. And once ordained, you are ordained unless you're defrocked. And so they would just do transfer exams to get him to speak about his orthodoxy, right? Yep. Yeah, Sarah. Um, as far as I know, I mean, a Holy Trinity Reformed Church up in Indy was Baptist, and they may have been affiliated with some general group of churches. Um, Jeremy Vandergalian used to be in the, um, what denomination did he come from? He held his credentials in... Uh, I'm not going to remember it. It's gone. But his church is independent. So he was working out of bounds and is working out of bounds there now. Yeah. 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 I do. I do want to. I I do want to um, point out that we had one lasting effect on the PCA. I don't know if you guys remember this, but our session sent up an overture that made it through Calvary Presbytery, went to GA, and and actually got passed, it was a BCO change that made one sentence in the directory for worship constitutional. And that one, we wanted the whole chapter on marriage to be constitutional. Their, their, their directory for worship is not constitutional. It doesn't carry constitutional weight. But there's now one sentence that marriage is between one man and one woman. And that's constitutional in the PCA. And so I look at that and I think, well, I'm glad we pushed that through. I'm glad we pushed that through, but we'll see how they'll manipulate it in the coming years. Um, yeah, what you got to remember, like the PCA, it's you have thousands of churches, you have 60 some presbyteries, then you have another level called General Assembly, right? We're one presbytery. We're 10 churches, one presbytery. If we got a number of southern churches, then I would hope that we would start a presbytery in those southern churches, um, and uh, we wouldn't have to travel so much to go to presbytery. But then that, and once you multiply presbyteries, then you have to have the higher structure of General Assembly reviewing the work of those presbyteries. And so it becomes, General Assembly for the PCA is, you know, 3,500 3, commissioners. Um, the, what they, one of the problems that they, they ended up doing is saying, we're too big an assembly. We, we need to, you know, farm out some of the work that the General Assembly usually does. And the first thing they got rid of was church discipline. General Assembly, church discipline, if, if there was an appeal up to General Assembly and the presbyteries couldn't handle it, the whole body would deliberate those things. 3,500 people deliberating on one man's discipline was good, but it took time, right? But now they outsourced all that to the Standing Judicial Commission, which is this body of elected people who handles all the discipline. And so it's become very political. Whoever gets on that, that, you know, that star commission or whatever, that star chamber, um, gets to make the decisions about discipline or not discipline. And so, yeah, things get harder the bigger you get. That's why it has to be done in order. That's why you have to follow rules. That's why you have to define things ahead of time. And you certainly... It would be much harder if there were no rules and you just made it up as you went along. It would be chaos. It would be a popularity contest. 
You know, it would be really bad, really bad. Any final last question that's burning in your heart over the Presbyterian polity? Yo. Sure. Yeah. 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 Of course. This needs so. I mean, I need so much help in in the work, and it's so good to be able to. Not just call another pastor who's disconnected, but call another pastor who has a vested interest and understands exactly. And we're yoked together. It's, it's wonderful. So, well, that's that. If you have other questions and are interested, let me know. But um, our Book of Church order is on our website, uh, Evangel Presbytery's website. It's bco.evangelpresbytery.com. And you can read till your heart's content. You can print a hard copy from the website. <laughs> no, they're not. It changes too often, actually, to print. So, I mean, we're tweaking a word here and a word there, and you hate to print a whole run of copies when you know it's going to be changing in the same year. So, website's much better. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your church. Thank you that you have told us in your word how to structure her, and Lord, may all of this uh, process and rules and, and uh, books of church order and confessions lead to the peace and purity of your church. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.